Hello, I'm David Ruzik, Illinois Energy Prof, and I'm here today to tell you about recent breakthroughs in fusion energy. So, what is fusion? Well, it's the energy source that powers the stars, and it's made using a plasma, not a solid, not a liquid, not a gas, but a plasma. 99% or more of the universe is a plasma state. We want to use that here on Earth for energy. Now, if you wanted to find the closest fusion energy reactor to you, it's the sun. And um, the sun is, uh, it, it works, right? But keep in mind that, you know, the sun's this big, and uh, by comparison, the Earth is maybe this big, probably even less. So we can't exactly do what the sun does here on the Earth. It makes a, a very dense, the density of the sun is denser than anything that we have on this planet by, you know, a good factor of eight or more. And it uses a reaction that would be very, very hard to do. But it makes fusion energy and it's a plasma. Now, can you do it on Earth? Not with gravity. We have to hold it together some other way. Um, because we can't get dense enough, and uh, we need also a much easier fuel to use. So what we're going to use are two isotopes of hydrogen. We're going to use deuterium, which is a neutron and a proton, okay? That's in the nucleus, right? And we're going to use tritium, which has two neutrons and one proton. They're both isotopes of hydrogen. But it turns out that these are things that can make the easiest fusion reaction, the one that can happen at the lowest temperature with the highest chance of success. Now, deuterium you get out of the seas. One out of every 6,500 water molecules is heavy water. Tritium is radioactive. It does not exist naturally. It has a 12-year half-life. But in this reaction, there is a way to breed, to create more tritium. Hello, Dave. Sort gentlemen. of something My wife, like Rosie this. and I would like to welcome you this afternoon. Today, you will witness the birth of a new fusion-based energy source. Safe, renewable energy and cheap electricity for everyone. They actually had scientists consult on this movie. I don't know about the Spider-Man arms, but the science isn't that far off. Precious tritium is the fuel that makes this project go. There's only 25 pounds of it on the whole planet. Remember, there is some deuterium in there, too. And of course, you need a loving glance to make anything work. Ladies and gentlemen, fasten your seatbelts. Lasers! and ignition. Well, sort of, right? Um, you can use lasers and a pellet of deuterium and tritium. That is what Livermore did. But it's a lot, lot bigger. And it's a lot, lot more expensive. And you don't really need the robot arms connected to your brain. But what you do need is either very strong lasers, or as I'll tell you, very strong magnetic fields. And you have to do it all in the absence of air. In other words, a vacuum system. So um, Spider-Man isn't quite the way. But they did do this in Livermore, California. They'd used lasers, a lot more of them, 
192, the biggest ones in the world. And it's at a facility called the National Ignition Facility. And they've been trying to do this for 25 years. They started the project, they got their first turn lasers on, right? Maybe 25 years ago. And it, um, it finally worked. To show how big the lasers are, um, we think of laser beam as, you know, a tiny little, little beam that comes somewhere. Well, these laser beams are, are this big in diameter, uh, so they won't actually break down the air. And then all of those are focused. A laser comes through each one of those big holes. That's where one of the lasers comes through. Then it's focused down onto this tiny pellet. Now, it looks like a, um, a part of a sewing machine, right? That, the, that you wind your thread on, the bobbin. But what it is, is that there is a small dot of deuterium and tritium fuel. And then around it is this metal can. And all the laser beams come in such that they're going to hit the metal and then bounce and hit this. All right? And you might say, well, that's kind of odd. Why don't they just hit this thing directly? And the reason is, is this material here is gold. And gold is very good at turning laser light into x-rays. Any heavy metal is. And that x-rays then bathe this pellet. And they do it much more uniformly. And having that uniform pressure condensing this, heating it up, and therefore making it fuse is the way that fusion in this type of system works. This reaction is not confined. It's called inertial confinement fusion because something sitting here can't suddenly disappear. It gets hotter. It implodes. Yes, it then explodes, but during that time you get more energy. What did they achieve? On December 5th in 2022, they put 2 million joules in. If I added up all these lasers, right, all the 192 laser beams that go into this, that adds up to 2 million joules of energy. And then they got 3 million joules out. Now, this is ignition because of the energy going into this little figure, you got more out. And it's the first time humans have done this other than in an uncontrolled device like a hydrogen bomb. So it's a very scientifically important experiment. Keep in mind, though, we're not on the brink of power plants. To make that 2 million joules okay, of laser light, it took 200 million joules of electricity. All right? And if that took 200 million joules of electricity, you had to use a certain amount of um, coal, natural gas, some type of other power, probably three times that, 600 million joules of some other resource to turn it first to electricity and then to laser light. So I think, at least, this is an unlikely way to make a power plant in the future. All right? And also, I should tell you, the three million joules that came out, million always sounds like a lot, but a joule isn't very much. Uh, three million joules would power a hair blow dryer for four minutes. So that was inertial confinement fusion. And you might wonder, is there a better way? Yes, there is. It's something I've been working on for, for my entire professional life, and many other scientists across the world, funded by the government, thank you for your tax dollars, but also now, finally, by commercial fusion companies. And when commercial companies get into things, they do it because they think they can ultimately make money. And that's a very, very good sign that maybe this technology will finally work. So what is this other way? Magnetic confinement. 
We want to make a shape um, like a, a donut. All right. So if I kind of draw a cross section, it looks like this. All right. It keeps coming out. You can see the picture there. And we're going to use it with magnetic fields. And these magnetic fields are made using superconductors. So once you put a current into them, they just stay at that magnetic field level. There's no electric bill to run the magnetic fields. You have to run the chillers, so there certainly is some cost. But the point of it is that you're not putting all this energy in where you get a very small percentage of that in your laser light. So while it's not perfect, if I get 20 times more energy out than what's into the plasma, I'm really getting somewhere on that order of amount of energy out. And that's why it can work better. Now, remember the sun? Um, it's very hot. And if I'm putting a sun inside here, all right, you know, a donut-shaped sun going around, um, this is going to be very, very hot on the walls. You can see in this, in this actual picture of our sun that there are wisps of solar flares and things coming out. And that's going to happen in a fusion device, too. It's going to hit these walls, these vacuum vessel walls. And it's going to look something like this. That's an arc welder, right? We are talking about energy fluxes that are on the same magnitude or same almost values as the surface of the sun. So how do you solve that problem? Well, the main line solution is to make this very, very big. So I have the same amount of fusion, and I make it really, really large, then I can reduce the amount of energy per unit area, right? But of course, that makes it very expensive. Now, the walls won't melt, and probably in part because they're using the atom, the element tungsten, which has the highest melting point of any other material that's a conductor. Uh, that's a metal conductor. So, the problem with that approach is it's very large, very expensive, and probably not something that could be commercial. But if we can make it smaller, we can make it more affordable. And the problem, of course, is that when I do make this all smaller for the same amount of heat inside, I'm going to have walls that melt. No problem. Let's start with melted walls. Let's start with flowing molten metal. And you might say the whole wall. It doesn't have to be the whole wall. Remember, I have magnetic fields, so I can kind of shape those magnetic fields that all of the heat flux comes out at specific spots. And these are the spots that need to be a liquid metal. All right, a flowing liquid metal. Yes, all around the torus, but not necessarily around the whole wall itself. And what metal do we want to choose? We want to choose lithium. Um, everything goes bad in a fusion reaction. All the losses go by the atomic number squared. What's an atomic number? Remember, if I have hydrogen, hydrogen has an atomic number of one. It has one proton in the middle. Lithium has the atomic number of three. There are three protons. Tungsten has an atomic number of 74. And if everything goes bad as that number squared, well, we've got a factor of 600 advantage, right? Take the 5,400, compare that to the 9, and wow, using lithium as your wall material is certainly going to give you advantages. Now, there's one other thing, and that's recent breakthroughs in the magnetic fields, the big magnets that go around this device, all right? These magnets, if we make them at a higher magnetic field, 
everything goes well. In fact, it goes better as the square of the magnetic field. So ITER, the standard way we're doing it, has fields of 6 Tesla, right? But these new Rebco magnetic field tapes, they can go at 20 Tesla. And if I square that number, right, then I'm going to have 400 to 36. That's another factor of 10 better. And this was a factor of 600 better. Now, do you really get those whole advantages? Probably not. 6,000 times better, but better enough that we might be able to afford to build it at a cost that would give you electricity that you wouldn't mind buying. I'm working with, as I said, several commercial companies, but one of the ones that was recently awarded a major grant from the U.S. government called the Milestone Based Fusion Grant is Tokamak Energy. And they are going to be using uh, liquid lithium. They're going to be using these high field tapes. And I think they have a reasonable chance of success. And so do the investors that are going into it. They say commercial fusion by 2038. Hope so. There's another company, Commonwealth Fusion Systems in the US, that also was funded from the same work, that also has very similar goals also using these high field tapes and lower atomic number materials. So I think that magnetic fusion energy, while we did not, like Livermore, yet create more energy out than in, has a higher potential to end up being a fusion energy breakthrough that might power your home someday. So in conclusion, Fusion research is a long-term project, but it can give us inexhaustible, clean, and on-demand energy. Livermore showed the public it's possible, phenomenal scientific accomplishment, and many companies now are competing across the world to do it, particularly with magnets and at an affordable cost. And that's what you need to know about breakthroughs in fusion energy.